Thank you very much. Uh, my name is John Jørgendal, and I'm representing the Norwegian Tax Administration. It's very interesting and, and encouraging to see uh, research and studies on tax administration and by tax administration, looking at uh, change and development and the impact on tax revenue. I've learned a lot, so thank you very much for your contribution and presentation today. As mentioned several times today as well, we live in um, a time where domestic revenue mobilization is crucial. It's all about this, the conference is all about that. Um, however, I'm representing a country and maybe an area of countries with tax authorities for different and, and, and reasons are more concerned with compliance, benefits for society and reduced cost of administration than tax revenues itself. Um, I'm mentioning this because it's important to recognize that tax administration are different and find themselves in different stages of development. So developing countries might have similar challenges, but tax authorities are definitely have their dissimilarities. So I might be knocking on uh, open doors here, but still it's, it's important to keep it in mind. It's both important and encouraging to see that all these three presentations are country-specific studies that are founding the base for adequate and sound policy implementation in those particular countries. Um, to Christos' presentation on audits and compliance in Uganda, showing some very encouraging results when he finds a positive relation between audit and compliance. Not surprisingly, maybe, based on the focus at least many Western countries have had two decades, uh, where they build up competence, at least believe that we have built up compliance as well. But as Christos pointed out himself, these studies are crucial to be done in the countries we look at and work in specifically. Although the correlation seems familiar, I wonder a bit about the finding um, that the results are not depending on the outcome of the audits. Uh, this is just my intuition, and, and I know you mentioned it yourself, that, uh, that it might be a little bit surprised. So, but, uh, and maybe there will be more about that later on, I don't know. Um, but I also like to dwell on some possible drivers here. Um, a famous, a famous uh, psychologist, Eric Kischler, working extensively on taxes actually, found in studies some years back, uh, I believe, that uh, a correlation between audits and control and compliance after control um, uh, uh, given that the level of compliance was relatively high to start with. On the contrary, he found that the correlation between audit and control and compliance to be negative if the compliance initially was good. So could the level of compliance among the auditing companies in Uganda be crucial for your findings? Secondly, is the fact that the companies are selected for audits a, su a sufficient condition alone for the outcome? I know that uh, you, Chris, has told me the other day as well, and, and you showed as well, that you've been doing some research in Rwanda Revenue Authority, where they found a negative correlation between desk audits and compliance. Uh, I have to say it surprised me a little bit, uh, as working with the Rwanda Revenue Authority, it's, it's, it's among the better tax administration uh, I've been working with, to be honest. But nevertheless, it also illustrates that the way we select, we do the audit, and possibly how we communicate as well with the companies might have an impact <clears throat> on the relation between audit and compliance. <clears throat> there might be room for more research and follow-up here for more clear policy implication, for instance, by looking at the differences in audits and maybe even examinations to see possible differences. The positive effects, though, from audits should make URI to keep the focus on comprehensive audits and proper risk selection. So, and then, of course, how often should the companies be audited, how long does the effect last, and so on. And all this, as, as Chris has mentioned as well, should be weighted against the capacity and alternative gains and alternative projects as well. Ezekiel Swema and Tira's pilot on a more risk-based approach to tax elimination shows a significant increase in the revenues of 10 to 15%. It's impressive. Thorough risk selection plays a crucial role in targeting audits and examination in order to maximize impact on compliance and revenues. I mentioned the study that uh, TRC has done in Rwanda where they found the desk audits to have a negative impact on compliance. Such a result may assumingly be caused by less thorough risk selection. 
And then I also have some questions to, to you, Ezekiel. Um, you are saying that the numbers of companies with adjusted taxable income is the same before and after the introduction of automized control. That has also surprised me a little bit, as I would believe that such adequate controls would lead to more flags and more selected firm, firms that are more likely to get the tax adjusted. You're also saying at the end that introducing this risk-based approach is more efficient than introducing more examination. It might be a likely consumption, but uh, have you actually controlled for that in the pilot? It's encouraging results as mentioned, and many of us know that establishing such control mechanism in a big core tax system and link a risk module um, with data from e-filing is a long way to go for many countries. Introducing this risk in an extra treat shows that it's possible to achieve results with more simple approaches in shorter time, even while you are planning a broader or new tax system. It will be interesting to see in future how both compliance and revenues develop. And Yenda and the colleague here. Um, Using bigger companies uh, as VAT agents is a creative solution, uh, and as you mentioned as well, is used in some uh, developing countries now. The results are also convincing, leading to a significant increase in sales and VAT. I believe the results are driven by the fact that agents have no or less reason to underreport or to deal uh, with the supplier. That leads me to a question as well. Apart from being serious, maintaining their positive reputation ETC, what's in it for the agents? If you could elaborate a little bit on that. It will also be interesting to know if there are challenges related um, to, to having such uh, withholding uh, agents. Another challenge, uh, to my knowledge, relating to withholding agents might be the fact that the suppliers selling to agents need to claim refund for VAT on purchases. I'm curious about the experience in Zambia and whether you are able to cope with an increasing number of claims. This is also a potential threat to the trust of the authority, if not handled well. So, um, and a related question then, as may, might be as well, whether you, based on the experience so far, uh, see yourself broadening or narrowing the use of agents, or whether you have found a healthy balance. This might also be a relevant question more for policymakers, but. Um, um, when I have the floor here, I also want to say something about uh, the approach to policy changes and, and domestic revenue mobilization in general. Uh, what should tax administration do? Many, many see uh, the urgent need for, for DRM, the uh, domestic revenue mobilization. Um, so due to increased rates, uh, interest on state loans, low revenues due to lower activity and increased cost due to inflation, Research and studies we have seen shown us that relatively uh, uh, narrow projects uh, and more traditional tax revenue approaches towards improved um, uh, can increase uh, the revenues. So, and, and um, a lot of, of good initiatives around. Um, so, but also some thoughts that, uh, based on my experience on building capacity in many countries, is like keep the project simple and narrow rather than big and ambitious. Take into account your capacity. Ask, do we have capacity to develop, carry it through, and to maintain? Focus on longer and more sustainable effects rather than shorter ones. One example is to ask yourself whether the domestic revenue mobilization project actually built trust towards the authority or reducing it. Is the society and or the government ready for your project? One example of one thought can be, is e-filing relevant for all taxpayer groups if they're not so much digitalized? Please also leapfrog, but make sure you land. And this is also related um, to the fact that you need to have capacity in order to, to, uh, to do that. And saying this is not a kind of a contra in contradiction to actually having longer strategic development goals for your organization. 
That is, that is crucial, of course. But it's, it's, it's not that this can go hand in hand uh, with, with smaller and more narrow projects as well. Just mention that capacity is important and you don't need to do everything uh, on the same time. So, and lastly, just one thing I would like to mention is like, uh, there's a number of crucial international uh, initiatives out here. Uh, digitalization is one. The BEPS two is another one. A lot of resources, uh, also on assistance and cooperation with partners in low or middle income countries, are currently, and most likely also, in the next two years, linked to these two subjects. No doubt about their importance, digitalization is the way to go. Uh, however, there is a, a long horizon of digitalization. It takes time. Global minimum tax is important to combat tax evasion on larger scale from multinationals. However, not all developing countries will gain significantly on revenues from this. We will certainly, and talking about NTA, contribute and do our part in raising awareness and build capacity on this. But I fear that is other CB, other capacity building, and even more crucial matters for some developing countries, might get too little resources and too little attention in the coming years. So please ask yourself, are these the most urgent matters when you do uh, projects, or do the partners have the level of capacity to take this on? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Trond, and thank you to our presenters. I think to kick off the Q&A session, I'll allow the presenters to just raise the questions that have been um, put forward by the discussant, and then we can open up to the floor. So, Ezekiel, do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, Trond, for that uh, uh, highlight on our, our paper. And uh, basically, you touched on the uh, two uh, areas, and uh, of course, one was uh, uh, it was uh, just a comment to, to me that uh, if these uh, uh, simpler uh, risk-based ba methodologies uh, or interventions can be uh, uh, beneficial, and uh, we surely need to <clears throat> capitalize on uh, this uh, uh, area. And I agree with you. Uh, if we do have uh, um, uh, a very uh, informative um, uh, uh, risk selection criteria that are in place and we really set into our system, uh, we can surely um, uh, have uh, uh, um, uh, selecting uh, risk sensitive taxpayers for the uh, um, examination uh, pur purpose. So uh, this is the way to go and uh, of course uh, not only limited to uh, one uh, tax uh, type, but uh, I agree also with you that we need to um, uh, uh, to expand uh, now the scope, not only to uh, to the CIT and the PIT, but also the other um, uh, major tax type, type like VAT and uh, and the like. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, again to. Uh, expand uh, the scope and uh, moving uh, forward by automating now these uh, 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 procedures into our system uh, and uh, the system to be telling us by by itself. But again, uh, uh, the question uh, which you um, uh, highlighted, uh, you mentioned if uh, we tested uh, this group with uh, with uh, other. Um, uh, uh, other group rather than in Dar es Salaam uh, only. Of course, I agree with you. Maybe uh, should be the, the scope of this uh, study, and uh, perhaps uh, in the future we may try to test uh, into different uh, uh, groups. And again, uh, uh, we could again maybe uh, confirm uh, our findings further if it was uh, uh, very effective. If we do uh, compare with the, with the rest of the of the group, so I. I concur with you, and perhaps it could be the area for uh, further improvement. Thank you, and I can stop there. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Trod. And uh, I'm going to be very brief because I, I, I agree with uh, everything you said. Um, I think your point about the subtlety of audits and the need to evaluate these audits, I think it's valid. And this is, this is one of the messages that we try to push through you know, this study and the other studies we have done on, on, this, on this concept. I mean, there's the presumption that audits are working 
effectively, but that's not actually true because it has to do with the, the content of the audit. It has to do with the, the signal, you know, these audits, you know, conveyed to the taxpayer and how these signals are being interpreted by the taxpayer. Um, so we have instances, not only from Rwanda, uh, I think this is something that, that, that I guess you alluded to, but not only from Rwanda, that we find a negative impact of audits, of desk audits, but there's a paper by, uh, you know, using US data. Um, uh, and they, in, they find that narrow scope audits, um, you know, uh, have a negative view on compliance as well. So, so I think I think I think the point is, uh, as, you, as you as you rightly s s said, that you know we, we need to be a little bit more careful, and we need to be focusing a little bit more on you know policy evaluation of, of those uh, um, initiatives. And so, thank you, thank you very much, thank you. Thank you, John. So, um, the one question that I picked up was, uh, what 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 would be the benefit to the agents if they engage in these withholding activities? And one thing that I would say is the reduction in their audit time. So usually the problem with the audit and authorities is to um, reduce the ghost suppliers. And in this case where without the withholding uh, mechanism, it was a bit difficult for the authority to be able to know where the supplier was coming from. But then in this case, they know because of the intervention and then it reduces the audit time for the agent. So that's uh, mainly what I would say on that. In terms of um, challenges with the um, VAD system, I would link that to the increased number of claims that um, results as a, because of the intervention. For that, I would say that now, um, we, we're looking at the increase in the number of filers. So the most important thing now is that now we have an increase in the number of filers. Initially they weren't there, but now we have them. So it's, it might be a bad thing that um, now we have an increase, increase in the number of claims, but then we should first look at the positives that we have um, all these firms who were not filing, now filing. So that's, that's a good thing. And I believe that the, the, the ZRA is putting in place measures to tackle the, the increased number of claims. Also, I agree with you um, that we need to talk about increasing or decreasing the number of agents. And I believe that it would be good to increase the number of agents in terms of um, having more withholding agents who would be able to um, reduce the uh, wait time or the transaction time for these um, specific VAT transactions. Um, reducing them won't be the best because I feel that in that case, then we, uh, we, the ZRA would not meet its target by reducing the, by, by increasing compliance. So um, I would say that the number of agents should increase, but cost-wise, as um, we put in the presentation, we should look at the costs involved here. Yeah, so thanks a lot. Thank you so much um, for those uh, responses. Oh, I see. Ayanda, am I audible? Yes, you are, Ayanda. Do you want to add something no, quickly? You. Maybe uh, just a minute so that we can give a chance for the questions yes. on the floor as well. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll just go straight to the last question, which was uh, on whether we the Zambia Revenue Authority is thinking of broadening or narrowing the number of agents. And, um, well, as Fabena has put it, yes, it, it, it would be nice to, to increase the, the number of participants in the withholding. However, um, we've noticed the cost associated so far, which, which was never thought of in the design at the beginning, is uh, some firms there's some withholding firms who are beginning to hold on to the withheld VAT instead of remitting it to the authority because the authority owes them VAT refunds. And you know, um, the issue of VAT refunds, uh, probably in the African context, uh, you can always never be um, up to date. There's always a backlog here and there due to maybe the, the risk-based audits that have to be done on the claims before you pay and also other factors. 
uh, how so you you we, we are finding that uh, now these agents are collecting yes we have the monies in the books we would have collected that VAT which would have otherwise not been collected however um the remit the remittance or compliance by the withholding agents was reducing over time due to them um trying to offset it against what ZRI owes them so going forward we we we, we are thinking I think on, on this last slide, we mentioned that in the design um, earlier this year, we even exempted withholding agents from without, withholding among us themselves because the quantums that now were, were sticking to, to, the, to the withholding agents were quite uh, huge. And probably going forward, a more lasting solution. I think in Tron's comments, I, 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 I noted that you mentioned we should focus on more um, uh, long-term solutions, long-term sustainable solutions to revenue mobilization. And uh, as Zambia, we're thinking probably stronger uh, fiscalization uh, where we can have um, um, cost-efficient uh, fiscal uh, devices which can help in the administration of, uh, of VAT, probably software-based um, uh, fiscalization solutions could be a longer-term solution because then we'll be able to to capture the VAT on our own in real time basis, depending on the coverage of these fiscal systems. I think that's what I can add for now. Thank you. Thank you, Enda. As someone from the uh, a, a national treasury myself, I love when people have a consideration of the fiscal costs that are associated to their recommendations. So if we can open up to the floor, um, if you could just raise your hands, I think we'll take three questions at a time. I see one hand at the back and another one um, uh, here in front, so maybe if you can take the gentleman at the, at the back um, and the gentleman in the front, and then I'll allow one, um, I'll allow one uh, online question, and then we'll begin the next round with you. Thanks. Okay, thank you for the presentations. Now, just one thing which I think is missing from the presentations. What is the cost of compliance from the farm side? Because maybe there are bottlenecks in terms of reporting. If that is the case, then there'll be no incentive for farms to uh, comply with the ta uh, tax returns. So they only comply when they are audited because now they know they are on the radar. So how, uh, that is missing from all the presentations. I think that would be important because maybe there's no infrastructure for reporting. It's very costly for farms. So they try to avoid that cost by not complying. Thank you. This question is uh, for Ezekiel Zuema. Um, how did the tax officers in Tanzania Revenue Authority react to introducing the risk-based engine since the, this new device may have reduced their self-examination, leading them to compete against technology. Thank you. And then we can take one more um, from the gentleman here in the, in the middle. Thanks. Yeah, um, thank you very much. My name is Wazili Gomek. I'm from Malawi. Um, two questions, I think, to start with the last one on the, uh, withholding VAT. I think the most argument against the withholding VAT relates to the taxpayers, the impact it has on the taxpayers. Uh, I think the benefits to the tax administration are well documented. Um, so I was wondering if it would be beneficial for Zambia, and maybe this is just a comment, to go the other way to see what has been the impact and as the discussant has raised the issue of tax refunds, because you are withholding uh, 100 percent as it happens in Zambia and not uh, a fraction of it. Uh, what has been the impact on tax refunds? Has that increased and what is the repayment period? I think the discussion did raise that uh, but I didn't hear the response to this. I think this is a very critical issue when you're dealing with withholding VAT because the impact it might have on uh, the businesses might be significant, especially when you're withholding 100%. Uh, that's the first issue. The second issue on the uh, issue of uh, CIT audits. Um, I was wondering on the results you got on sector specific. And uh, to this, I was wondering, what did you note in terms of uh, 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 the compliance of uh, uh, two sectors, uh, financial, and telecommunication. I want to, if you have any insights on this, because when we're look, looking at the developing countries, 
these are the two sectors that are contributing maybe 50% or more of the revenues. So I'd want to see if, uh, what the picture is looking like when you look at the audits in these sectors. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, if we could just try and keep the responses very concise so that we can do another round of questions before our session ends. Um, because we still have Yenda online, I think I'll let him go first before we lose him, and then uh, we can then go over to Ezekiel. Uh, thank you, Ayanda. Um, I think the, the, I got two questions, uh, which is uh, the cost of compliance, so probably for VAT in this case. And also the other one, which was on the impact of uh, the withholding on VAT refunds. Um, to start with, on the cost of compliance for VAT, uh, the way the, the requirements for VAT in Zambia are such that uh, uh, companies beyond or firms beyond a certain level of uh, uh, of, of uh, annual turnover are expected to register for VAT. And, and the major assumption beyond this is that uh, these firms should be able to, to meet these requirements, these uh, formal requirements for, for complying to VAT, which uh, are premised on keeping proper books of records of accounts. Um, and then the, below that threshold, you have businesses which pay on a presumptive nature to take into account that it may be costly for them to maintain their books and so forth. And uh, only when a firm decides to voluntarily register, which falls below this VAT threshold, is when they can be allowed to go onto the VAT register. So in short, um, it's expected that, uh, well, what I can say is it's expected that firms should comply to the, to the requirements, but due to the informal nature of, of our economy, we we're observing that it was, it's again easy for smaller firms, especially who are on the VAT register to, to disappear from the VAT chain. That was the, the fundamental problem. So you, you would have, because systems are not intercon interconnected, are, are largely not interconnected in our economies, you find you can't, you can't trace them through the banking system because you're not interconnected through the insurance and so forth. So this VAT would be gone. Meanwhile, the business has, has collected the, B, the VAT, they are registered for VAT, but their demographics on the system are not traceable and so forth. So this was where probably the withholding VAT was coming in. Um, I think that, that would be my comment on that. Maybe Kwabena can, can, can add. Um, on the impact of, 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 of the withholding on, on refunds, yes. Because now you are collecting uh, VAT uh, essentially from more firms than before. There's more reporting um, than before the, the reform. Uh, also, the share that has to be claimed by the, by the taxpayers uh, increases at the point of uh, introducing the reform. And, uh, well, the, the, the only uh, consolation in this case is that in terms of the accounting, because uh, this firm is, is, is only appearing on the books because they participated in a transaction which you can, you can observe from another taxpayer. So in terms of the accounting, it, it's an in-out. It's an in-out in terms of the accounting. Yes, there's an increase in, in terms of refunds, but there's also an increase in terms of gross collections. So it's, it's coming from, I think it's stemming from there. It's, it's, it's an in-out, it's an equal share going in or coming out, or rather even a bigger share now coming in because there's some gross receipts which are entailed based on the value added instead of the inputs. I think I would, I would end here for now. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Yende. Is it Kelly? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, uh, it was a, indeed a good question. And uh, I can respond by saying uh, change management uh, is a process. Uh, whenever you are coming up with a new way of uh, doing things, sometimes uh, you might uh, um, get some challenges, but uh, at least during the, um, uh, the, the, the period for the uh, intervention, we tried to control and it was um, uh, uh, faring well. But now moving forward, we now uh, use uh, uh, 
uh, ways of technology and uh, try to uh, convince the management uh, so that to uh, integrate uh, the intervention through the system so that it can be the only way uh, to go. But I can confirm that uh, uh, change management is the process and uh, that's a way to do. And uh, uh, of course, the ob objective of the uh, intervention were uh, clearly set. One is also to uh, reduce the time that we, are, we do spend in doing uh, uh, examination uh, uh, procedures. And uh, again, we are looking forward to increase uh, 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 revenue and uh, resources, uh, of course, are, are scarce, so we need to uh, utilize them uh, uh, effectively. Yeah. Thanks, Ezekiel. Um, because we had one hand that was left over in the last round, I think I'll let um, the lady at the back come in uh, because we are out of time. Um, so I'll just go with that question and then we can close the session. Thanks. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Julia Mascagni from the International Center of Tax and Development. Uh, I'm standing between you and lunch, so I will be very, very quick. Um, it is a question for Christos and team, uh, which we can discuss later. Uh, I was intrigued by your result on uh, audits increasing revenue for both compliant and non-compliant taxpayers. And I'm wondering um, if we can maybe discuss more separately or if you want to say a few words about why do you think that happens and what does it say about the audit quality or the kind of signals that the audit process gives aside from uh, just uh, improving compliance. Uh, you mentioned the word signals before and I was intrigued uh, by that. Thanks. Yeah, th th thank you. I, I th yeah, I think I have, I have one minute. It's not enough. It's not enough to go through that. But uh, I mean, we're trying to understand why, why this is the case. Uh, clearly, as I said, signaling is going to matter. Um, you know, the process by which the tax authority does uh, audit matters is the tick box exercise. I mean, do. Uh, narrow scope audits uh, later on if they find something they lead it to comprehensive uh, we need to look at the process a little bit more carefully uh, but I think yeah I, I completely <laughs> agree with you that this is this is quite surprising but uh, uh, at this point in time we can speculate uh, but unfortunately we don't have a good, <laughs> a good understanding of the mechanism as yet but uh, no, thank you for that yeah so thank you everyone, thank you for your participation and thank you for the really great questions to the panel and thank you for Kobena for stepping in. Um, a round of applause to everyone and, and off to lunch. Thanks. Thank